good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our broadcast here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I thank you for your patience, everyone. We had a little technical missed you, but we are good to go, and I really appreciate your patience. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. This is our epic Oceans Week in conjunction with the amazing folks at the Explorers Club. This is my abridged introduction, and today I'm really excited to have Salame Bagwas. She is a researcher who gets to work in one of the coolest places on this planet, that is the Galapagos Islands, but they're not just a treasure trove of biodiversity above the surface, but below as well. Her research helps understand some of the amazing things that are happening as we work to protect this really special area and assess the incredible species that live there. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome her in to blow your mind with all the cool stuff she gets to do. Thank you so much for joining from across Canada, the U.S., Port of Spain, and more. It's such a thrill having so many amazing students. Salome, welcome to the broadcast, and uh, <laughs> you are good to go. Hey. <laughs> great, great, great. Uh, everyone can hear me? That's that's for sure. We are so, so set. It couldn't be better now. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> well, Only the one I wish I, problem. <laughs> awesome. I wish I could see everybody, but it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to share with you guys about uh, my work in exploring and studying life in the deep sea and the oceans of the Galapagos. And before I start, I just want to say that I am based, uh, I'm presenting to you today from my university campus in Vancouver. And we're based on the ancestral lands of the um, um, Squamish nation. So, no, sorry, from the Musqueam First Nations. And yeah, and let's get cracking. So, let me see. Okay, so a little bit about me. I am, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I identify as an Afro-Caribbean woman, <laughs> uh, but I'm a bit of a mix. This is why my accent is probably a bit hard to place. My mom is from Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela. Shout out to my Trini crew. Um, and my dad is British and German. And I grew up and lived in many places, particularly Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and Canada. And, um, yeah, uh, but my true identification is that I am a marine ecologist. And a marine ecologist is someone who uh, studies, studies uh, the way animals and uh, marine plants interact together and live in their environment. And I'm trying to find out uh, using, analyzing different things in the ocean like water chemistry or finding out the relationships between organisms to understand why certain species are found in certain places. And um, I didn't start as a marine biologist. Um, I didn't know I, I wanted to become a marine biologist. In fact, I, even, I didn't even study marine biology. I studied geography. Uh, and uh, geography is the study of all the things that happen on the surface of land. And so my beginning was on, on on the land where I was, but I was really into aquatic organisms from the get-go. So I was studying freshwater ecosystems, particularly insects and looking at water quality. And after I graduated, I got the chance to go back to my mother's homeland, um, which is Trinidad and Tobago. And there I got very lucky. I got a scholarship to learn how to scuba dive. That's us scuba diving there. And while I was learning how to scuba dive, I managed to witness a really shocking event, which what you see here is all white, is a mass bleaching event, which is when corals, corals in our reef are getting too warm and they expel uh, uh, algae that lives inside them, which they live in a happy relationship with. They share food and they have to expel that algae and then they turn bright white. And when I saw this, I realized I really want to study this more and in more detail, not knowing that that's what lead me, would lead me to become a marine ecologist. Uh, I went, I did a master's degree here at UBC, and I went back to Trinidad and Tobago, which is what you can see on the map here. And I applied my new skill set, which was to scuba dive so that I could survey uh, these reefs and I wanted to find out how and um, if they had recovered from this bleaching event. Here you can see um, I have a, that white line is a measuring tape and that's what we call a transect line and I have got my clipboard and I'm writing down notes and I think I've got a camera that you can't see there where I'm photographing every 
every section along this transect line just to see what corals are living or not. And um, after I completed this, I was very, very lucky because I got a job at this place here that you can see. This is the Charles Darwin Research Station in the Galapagos. Now the Galapagos, as you can see on this world map, are these islands that are a province of the, that is a part of Ecuador. Ecuador is a country in South America. We speak Spanish here. And um, I got the chance to move here into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And this is where I was based and where the hour points is the Marine Research Station, um, where I joined the Galapagos Deep Sea Research Project. And um, I never looked back since. <laughs> and, and so when we're talking about the deep sea, what, are, what am I talking about? Now, most of us, um, uh, if we had the chance to see the ocean, uh, usually looks like this, this long, flat, endless space. But um, it is far from flat. <laughs> it sure is endless. <laughs> but um, it, it's not flat and it's, not, it's, it's full of life. And if we were to do a cross-section, of the ocean, what we have is um, uh, a very hilly place, just like for those of you who had the chance to see a landscape with mountains and hills. If you were to take out all the water from the ocean, those mountains and, and hills, they go on underneath that sea surface that we usually see. This is kind of like our, our eyes are limited to. But if we could see underwater like we see um, on the land, that's what we were looking at. So the seafloor actually goes up and down a lot. And any, any point past the coast or the beaches that some of you might have been able to experience, if you go deeper and deeper and deeper, once you pass 200 meters depth, um, that's what we call the deep sea. And it can get very deep. The deepest, the tallest mountains on this planet are in the ocean and the, on the steepest trenches are in the ocean. The deepest it can go is, um, that is, 11 kilometers now, pardon me, I cannot turn that into feet <laughs> or miles to you, but it's a long, long distance. Um, and one thing that I want you to take away from this image is, so the ocean, that beautiful blue ocean that you get to see on beaches, that is what we call the surface where light still penetrates and you can still see things. So if you've had the chance to put a mask on and snorkel, you can see that you can also see underwater a lot, but as you go deeper, your light goes away and it gets very dark and it also gets very cold. And this is something that characterizes the deep sea. It's a dark, uh, it's a dark, cold space. And uh, it kind of looks like this image here. It's the only way that we, well, if we get the chance to take technology or to go into the, the deeper spaces, you have to take a lot of light to be able to see things because there's absolutely no light. And one other thing I want you to, uh, to notice is that uh, in the sea, even though there is a lot of flat land, we have a lot of mountains, uh, and these we call seamounts. And these seamounts are very important places for those of us who study the deep sea. And that's because they are biodiversity hotspots. Now, seamounts are essentially, just as I said, they could be a, mount, a very, 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 very big mountain. Uh, they could also be a small one, and we tend to call these knolls or hills. And as long as they're by, uh, over 100 meters, it, 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 it can be a, a seamount. And what's so interesting about seamounts in the ocean is that they collide against the ocean currents. I don't know if you've seen Finding Nemo, but you know, or if you've noticed at the beach yourself, the ocean is full of currents. The ocean, the water is moving at the surface, at the bottom. So these currents, um, they bring up nutrient-rich water, so water that is full of nice chemicals that are lacking at the surface. And when these seamounts bring these waters to the surface, um, we have what we call productivity. Productivity is when tiny little uh, anim uh, organisms called phytoplankton, they're more like tiny little plants, they get that nutrient, they get to grow, and these this phytoplankton feeds uh, other invertebrates, even though these look like plants, these invertebrates are meant to represent corals and sponges and other invertebrates, and they all are mostly are filter feeders and they like to feed all of this. And together with that productivity and these coral reefs, uh, we get a lot of fish, 
a lot of small fish and a lot of big fish. And if we have fish, uh, no doubt there will be some humans. So often, um, uh, if you see lots of boats in an area in the middle of a flat ocean, maybe if you get the chance to be on a plane and you look down and there's lots of boats, it's probably a seamount there and they're probably fishing uh, because all of the biodiversity attracts uh, fish. Um, uh, one thing I want you to go away with, though, is that along the seamount, just like on a mountain, we have many ecosystems that transition as you go from the uh, shallow part to the deeper part. And in this transition, as I said earlier, it gets deeper and darker. So things that live deeper down on the seamount are living often in pitch black environments. It gets a lot colder and there's a lot of pressure. And this pressure is really critical because that's one of the reasons why we know so little about the ocean. This pressure has stopped us humans from being able to go deeper. For example, the scuba diving gear that I um, I wear to go and, and do my work underwater, I can only go as deep as 40 meters with that. If I wanna, if I go deeper, it gets dangerous. And that's because of the pressure puts so much weight on us. It starts to compress everything, the air we breathe, our bodies. So we need to use technology to get down into these deeper places. Now, going back to seamounts and how amazing they are. Um, so we know that seamounts are hotspots of biodiversity. Now the Galapagos Island, um, where I was working at, they are a volcanic uh, platform. Uh, so they are their or origin is, of, is volcanoes. And this 3D image on your uh, right here of the map, it kind of just shows you how hilly it is. Now the Galapagos is surrounded by deep water and the island archipelago itself is just a bunch of mountain islands above and below water. So what this means is that we have a lot of seamounts, we have a lot of complex topography, lots of steep and vertical features, which means that we probably have a huge amount of incredible deep sea biodiversity. And I've been lucky enough to be part of the team that gets to explore this. And the way that we've been doing this because of the um, difficulties of reaching the deep, we have we use different things and there is such a thing as what we call technical diving which is the first image that you see here which is when you use more and more tanks to give you more air and more time but that uh, this type of technical diving that we've been using only gets us up to 60 meters i myself work a lot with rovs remotely operated vehicles which is essentially like this little robot on a long tether or a cord the reason why we have to use a cord and we cannot fly it like a drone right, without a cord um, is because GPS uh, doesn't work underwater. GPS is a way in which you can track and send and receive back information from your drone. Underwater, this doesn't happen. So we have to keep a cord in which we communicate to our ROV. Um, then there are really sophisticated ROVs um, like this one here, the one that you see that's yellow, that is uh, the Hercules. This, this ROV is like the size of a small bathroom, it's huge. And this can go down, down to up to 7,000 meters. Uh, obviously no person inside. <laughs> and then other, the other ways to get deeper is, and, and with people is um, uh, what we call, there are many submarines, what we call submersibles, and those can be tripulated. So usually they can carry max three people. This is one um, that can go down to 600 meters, the one on your far left. And then the white one here, that's the Alvin. That is the submarine, the only submarine that can go as deep as 6,500 meters. Um, it's one of the oldest um, um, submarines in the world. And it recently came to the Galapagos and I'll share more about it briefly. And then we are, and then the other tools that we use are drop cams, which are the most basic but they're incredibly efficient. This is a camera that is, you can just put a camera inside a little, uh, in a protective housing and we drop it as deep as 6,000 meters and we've gone to use those as well. And my first experience of looking at the deep sea organisms in the Galapagos uh, was when I got the data from this expedition that happened in Galapagos in 2015 and the Hercules came and it explored several sites. And this is some footage of, footage of what's happening deep down at 6,000 feet, so that's around 2,000 meters. And what you see here is a little cat shark 
He's very confused by the lights, obviously. But only look, notice how there's actually a lot of things. We have another fish in the back, and all the kind of things that look like plants are actually corals. And this is an anemone. And yeah, it's there's actually a lot of beautiful, colorful life down there, despite the fact that it's pitch black. Um, here we see an octopus. Um, this octopus, notice how he moves really, really slowly compared to when we usually see octopus. That's because it's very cold. Remember, it's very cold in the deep and you have to save energy. And that reaction there is possibly also, he's probably bothered by the amount of light that's being, uh, that is shining on him right now from that footage. And then lastly, uh, from this expedition, I want to show you this beautiful coral reef. Now look at these colors. These are also corals, unlike the corals that I studied in Tobago's shallow coast. These um, only filter feed. They, they don't do photosynthesis with, together with algae. And these are, these are what we call hard corals here. These are soft corals. These are some squat lobsters. They're pretty big. They're like, I don't know if you can see my footage, but they're like about this big. And this was found around um, 450 meters. And I was just blown away by, I had never seen anything like this until I started working on this project. And I was so keen to find out more. So I decided to do my own ex exploring. So I decided to look for an ROV that we could afford. Uh, so I collaborated with a company that makes these small ROVs and we decided to explore the um, habitat that is found between 40 and 200 meters. Uh, this is what this ROV looks like. We launch it from a boat. There's the long tether that I was speaking about. And oh, I hope this video shows better than this. Oh no, I don't think this video is showing very well, but what I wanted to yeah. show you here was one of the cool findings. Let me see if my other video works. This is, this is playing, it's just, it's a darker. Oh video but it is playing it's fine yeah oh okay how about is this one showing better oh it's perfect this is gorgeous oh, okay yeah, kelp forest magical <laughs> you got it yeah so when we when i sent the rov down to um some of the sh shorter sea, uh, smaller seamounts that i wanted to explore uh, i never thought i would find a kelp forest now this was a huge huge surprise i wasn't looking for kelp forest why because this is a a habitat that needs light. It photosynthesizes. Kelps are seaweeds, and seaweeds are like plants. They photosynthesize. So I was not expecting to find them in these deeper, less light, in these habitats with less light. But as you can see, there's some light. So when I found this kelp forest, it brought the uh, it even got to the attention of Herb Deepness, um, uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle, who uh, is a a seaweed scientist herself uh, by training back in the days before she became a, um, a celebrity and advocate for the ocean. And she uh, was super keen to hear about what I'd found. Uh, so she said, I'm going to bring a submarine and we're going to go and check them out in a submarine. And that was an amazing experience. So then I got to go down and I got to see the kelp forest, um, not just through the eyes, uh, through the um, faraway eyes from an ROV, and bought myself uh, inside of a sub and that was amazing. I got to see how extensive this kelp forest is. And uh, what we've learned is that this is a habitat that's a lot more abundant than we thought. And this is what I'm doing my PhD on. So like most of you, I'm a student as well, still an eternal student because I'm a PhD student. And this is what I'm studying and I'm characterizing now these ecosystems. This, this, what you see here is what I'm looking at all day long. <laughs> and this, I just want to share with you the footage of how I've been collecting my data. So I've gone back to this kelp forest and my ROV has a little arm and I get to, and what I'm trying to do is sample, trying to get hold of these kelp samples so that I can study them in greater detail. So here, this is the arm of the ROV and I managed to grab the kelp sample that I wanted, trying to pull it out there and up we go. And I'm doing all of this from a remote control, kind of like a PlayStation. What was really funny here is that this Galapagos sea lion was trying to snatch my kelp, uh, my prized kelp sample. That was a lot of work to take, so I was panicking, uh, but my uh, ROV managed to hold on to it really tight. And that's the face of a happy marine biologist with their prized sample. And so what I do with these kelps is to study them 
uh, one of the methods that I'm doing is I'm trying to understand how old they are. And just like trees, I cut through their stipe, their stem here. And what you can see here, these kind of like round medallion things are cross sections of the stipe. And I'm counting the rings to see how old they are. And for now, I know that most of them are around five years old, which is really interesting. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, holler at me at another time and I can tell you more about kelp. But I also finally want to share with you quickly before my time's up um, uh, other, other data that we've collected using these deep sea drop cameras uh, together with National Geographic. Uh, we've been going around the entire archipelago dropping these cameras. These are much easier to use. And what we do is uh, from a small boat, uh, we set up our camera and what we do is we put bait in it. By bait, I mean we use tuna, uh, like big tuna steaks. The more rotten they are, the better. We just want them to be smelly. Um, and then we drop the camera into the ocean. We put a weight on it and it sinks. And what we found was amazing. We actually discovered two new species of sharks that we didn't know were in Galapagos. These are cow sharks. This is a six-gill cow shark. And this is a seven gill cow shark. Uh, these are prehistoric sharks, and we didn't know they were in the Galapagos, and now we do. And it just shows the importance of just getting the tools to be able to understand more about what's living in our area here and in, in this and this side, particularly the Galapagos. And lastly, I want to share with you uh, my latest expedition, and I was very very lucky because the Atlantis. Uh, this is a boat a ship from the American Navy, came to the Galapagos, and this is the Alvin. Uh, it's in the marine world, this, uh, this submarine is a celebrity. <laughs> and it's um, what you can see here is this is a titanium sphere where the whole, and then it has little windows. And three, passing, uh, three observers, usually marine biologists or geologists, can go there and a pilot can go inside. And what you see at the front here are its arms, so it can grab things. And um, I was very, 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 very happy to get to go down there with Denise. Denise is a geologist, so I went down to study the marine, the marine biology side of things. She was there to do the geology. And we got to go down to 700, 300 meters. This is a picture of me from the inside. Even though this window looks very, very small, um, it's more than enough. I spent seven hours just kneeling down there, staring outside. And what we got to see, this is an example of some footage we got to see. This is a deep sea coral reef in the Galapagos. It's possibly the biggest reef in the Galapagos. We didn't know it was down here. This is between six and 600 meters. That noise you hear there is um, the submarine uh, adjusting its buoyancy. This here is Oh, there's so much life here. There's hard corals, soft corals, brittle stars, urchins, fish. And the white part, the white things you see are the, the coral skeletons. Um, but that doesn't mean they're dead. That just shows how long they've been living here. So you have a mix of lots of old coral skeletons um, at the bottom and above them is the living part of the coral. And we just could not believe how long and extensive this coral, this coral reef was. Um, uh, this is a jelly nose fish that we saw. Uh, they, this guy, these are pretty big. They are just the most beautiful, smooth fish. They have these um, kind of like antenna-like things at the bottom, which they use to monitor. That noise there that you hear, that's the submarine adjusting its buoyancy. That's a, some fish that are getting probably freaked out by the, um, all the amount of light. And then the last video I want to show you is one of my favorites. I love these redfish. These are orange roughies and this <laughs> shark came and just not sure what he's doing, but it just knocked him over. I'll show that to you guys one more time. Um, so we're watching this and this cat shark just comes and knocks him over. And I think this is all I have time for, but I hope I uh, made you made you want to know more about the deep sea and and i just want you the takeaway here is there's so much life down there and we know so little about it and it's really important that we continue studying because we're getting the technology to go down there and when we go down there we want to be responsible about what we do and we want to most of all conserve it and protect it for the future generations 
Oh, so long. That was unbelievable. Thank you so, so much for that. If you want to exit screen share so you can see us again, have a bit of a conversation, you will get to see those kids that you want to see. So, but, yes. <laughs> uh, and I will note too, the number of people who've been into submersible just generally in the world is maybe in the thousands ever in history. Mm. But the number of people who've been with Sylvia Earle in a submersible is a very, very select crew. You are the, one of the luckiest people on planet Earth. I am. I am. So. Very, right place very, at the right time. <laughs> seriously. Oh, um, we're going to go live with our classes. I'm going to great groups today. If you're on YouTube and you want to share questions, we've got about 15 minutes for a Q&A. So I'm going to head to Miss Dylan's class in Farmington, Missouri first. Uh, if you guys want to come on in and kick us off, you're good to go. Hey. Uh, you oh, no. um, you're good. How deep have you gone? And um, what's your favorite thing that you've seen while diving? Uh, the deepest I have been is was in the Alvin. That was 700 meters. And it's very, very hard for me to pick my favorite thing. But, um, the, I mean, the sharks, oh, the sharks are just amazing to see. And not, not just because they're, like, these big and dangerous. They're just the diversity of sharks in the deep sea is incredible. They usually tend to be quite small, most of them. And they just have lots of, like, there's some that have, like, leopard patterns and... Their eyes are really cute. They tend to have really big eyes. So, yeah, I love them. So, so cool. Great question, guys. And by the way, Alvin, we featured like some of the upgrades to Alvin. It is like the, it's the most iconic research vessel in the world. It's one of the most iconic of anything we've ever made as a human species. So, if you get the chance to check out our YouTube channel, Alvin's pretty rocket. Um, I'm so excited. We have Miss Joseph's class joining us for Spain in Trinidad today. So, I'm going to come to you on the night. Welcome in. Hi, everyone. Hey. Oh, so nice to have you today. I, every time we get a chance to have, oh, your your mic's on, but it's not active right now. I don't know why. Smack the computer and see if it works. But in any case, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. It's nice to give you guys a shout out. Type your question in the chat, and I'll come and bring you back on live, even if the mic isn't working, and I'll share it on behalf of you, okay? So type it in the chat on the side. Um, sorry that the text's being weird. This is half the fun. Some things should go wrong every time, but so nice to have you guys in. So let me, uh, the person, we, I, I'll bring them back in a second. Yeah. We'll get the in. I'm going to go to Ms. Brown's class in a second too. Um, my favorite program we've ever done up to this point was Diva Amon, who's a Trinidadian deep sea. Oh, yeah. So you can check out her programs too. But Trinidad is really representing with some really, like truly astounding women. So, so let me, it's been such a pleasure. I know. Flag right there. I know. <laughs> it's the best. It's one of the great flags in the world. It really is. Um, Miss Brown's class. I'm going to head to you guys while we're waiting for our Port of Spain crew. Uh, Miami, welcome in eighth graders and uh, take us away. Hello. Hey, Miss Brown. <laughs> oh, they they're, they're done. They're, they're, the day's over. We lost the okay. line, but it was, I get it. 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 Miss Joseph's it. class still typing. <laughs> YouTubers. Oh, um, yeah. So they want to know if there's any more development on the bleaching of corals in Tobago. So. Are we working on this in any way? Are we helping to save them at all? What's the deal? I, I, uh, I would lie if I say that I know the latest, but yeah. I know that the there are still good and healthy coral reefs, especially in Speyside. Um, I've seen, I follow some people who dive there and the corals are looking like they're still there and they're still alive. They are probably still not immune to uh, being bleached because our yeah, climate change is coming and our summers are getting warmer. But what I found in my research is that the coral species that are still left are the most resilient. So, uh, and they're the hardiest and the most adapted to these types of drastic changes. So I think that the corals will stay. We'll just see a switch in species. Yeah, we've been uh, doing programs with coral reef researchers for years now. Australia has a really cool lab where they take some of those hardy corals and sort of grow them and sort of plant them once they've gotten a little bit bigger, which is very neat. Um, Tim Lamont, I featured earlier today, talks about sort of going to reefs where you've got, you play fish sound to the healthy reef. And because of that, the fish come and repopulate the reef, which is spectacular. Um, so there's a lot of really great stuff going on in coral reef research. And I'm so glad we get the chance to feature some of those stories for Oceans Week this week. Miss Brown's class, yeah. they came back. I'm going to come to you guys. I'm like, <laughs> for us. Welcome in. Hey. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Right. So we wanted to know how often you go down and also what's the deepest you down. Yes. Uh, so yes. how often? <laughs> so we don't get to go down a lot, only when we get um, a visit from one of these um, international research ships that have a submersible. Um, 
But when they do come, we try to go as many times as we can. Usually with the Alvin, we can only go once a day. Uh, the other types of submersibles, uh, like the little, you know, with the glass bowl, those ones we can usually do two times a day. Uh, but it really depends how deep you're going. So, for example, with the Alvin, uh, if we went down to 2,000 meters, it takes about uh, like two hours just to get down to that depth and two hours to come back up. So, um, uh, yeah, and you want to spend as, lo as much time as you can in the bottom. So it's usually just one dive a day. And this is the chance of a submersible coming to the Galapagos is like once in a moon. So uh, not very often. It is a complete treat, and I am extremely lucky. Seriously, it's one of the it's one of the rarest things. It's one of the hardest things to organize, coordinate, uh, make sure it goes off without a hitch. I mean, deep sea research is still in its infancy. Really, we are a uh, class. Okay. The moon is more explored than the deep sea. I think that still holds true. And I mean, it highlights, it underscores the fact that there's so much more to discover and there's so many exciting things out there. So I'm so glad we got that question. Thanks, guys. Miss Joseph. Please do share more in the chat. I'd love to take many from you. We've still got about eight more minutes. Uh, but Miss Dylan's class, I'm coming to you guys back again. Welcome in. Hi, my name is Peyton Gage. Have you ever ran out of oxygen underwater? And how long do you stay underwater for? Oh, um, hi, Paige. Um, yeah, so when I'm scuba diving, you can definitely run out of oxygen. And we are usually, we have these devices uh, that tell us how much air we have left in our tanks. So when you're a good diver, you always check that and you always make sure that you go up before you only have, um, until, you, until you have like around 20% of that, of your tanks still left. So I've been a very good responsible diver, so I've never run out of air. <laughs> and um, I, I can't remember the second question. No, oh, the second, uh, we'll head back. Come on in again. What was the second part of your question after running out of air? Sorry. How long do you stay underwater for? Oh, well, diving, diving, uh, we usually stay around 45 minutes uh, when I scuba dive. But in a submarine, uh, the longest I've been down there was seven hours. So, so fun. Um, I will note for our kids, because I've been harping on this all Oceans Week long, um, and so let me, I'll share the question in the chat just so I can make sure that everyone hears it in a sec, so I'll, I'll keep get to that. Um, our classes, if you are over eight years old, you can start on the path of becoming a scuba diver. Patty Bubble Maker is the first thing you can wow. do once you're 10. You can do open water, which is what I have, so it's like the bare minimum, but it's like black magic, and you can, now 70% of the world is open to you if you have the power to scuba dive, so I really encourage yes. our classes. Even if you're landlocked, Miami class, you guys are good to go. But even if you're in Saskatchewan or Iowa, you can go learn to scuba dive, pools, quarries, and more. And it's just a magical, magical experience. Uh, Miss Joseph, I'm going to come said, bring you guys back on. They want to know what's the weirdest species you've encountered when exploring under the sea. What's the strangest thing you've ever checked out? <laughs> Great question. Um, the weirdest thing is a carnivore a sponge. It's a sponge that eats organisms. It's kind of like this long stalk, and it has like, it honestly looks like a feather, like and, but uh, when we collected one, um, it had lots of worms on it that were kind of like they're getting their blood sucked out of it, and it just like traps them and it just absorbs, eats them, and it was, I never expected to find that, and this is a, a sponge that we found at three thousand meters depth, so um, that just shows how little food is down at depth, so that if anything passes by, you just grab it and yeah, they just like devour it i'm i just brought up found a picture this might not be the specific one you found but if you look up carnivorous sponge this is the freaky thing that comes up uh as the first image and like that is just like some yeah. <laughs> alien movie terror like what is that thing like back the submersible away uh, <laughs> this is uh, one of the joys of deep sea stuff i mean the freakiest things on earth if you were to scale them up to a human size all of them would just like chill the blood basically it's a really fantastic environment um, we're going to head to Ms. Brown's class. If you guys have a second question, come on in. And then soon, unfortunately, we got so many programs. We have just like, just too much fun that we're having for Ocean Week. <laughs> but we'll take a few more before we wrap up. Ms. Brown, come on. Hey. That's okay. We got weird stuff going on in Ms. Brown's class. This is not the fun. Um, I, heard, I think I heard German uh, there. <laughs> well, they're German, German class. Uh, German oh. Class. Yeah, awesome. um, Miss Dylan's class, come on back in for one more with another band t shirt. What is with it today in band t shirts? It's like the seventh one. I love it. Anyway, come on in. 
Um, why do you de um, see fish have eyes if they don't see anything down there? And Ooh, and do this how did the fish not get crushed due to the pressure? Yes, great questions. Why do they have eyes if it's dark down there? And how do they not get crushed, Alame? <laughs> I have I have answers for the first question. The second one, I'm not 100 percent sure. But um, the and the 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 first one is why do they have eyes that deep? That's because even though after 200 meters, we tend to think that there's very little light, especially as humans, because our for us it's just like pitch black. There's probably still some lights coming in, some light coming in, and they must have just like owls and, and any species that we know that hunt at night, they just have, if they have really, really large eyes, it means that they're trying their best to just capture and use and work with whatever little light there actually is. And actually, by looking at this fish eyes, I, I kind of have an idea of where in the water this fish tends to live. If it has really big eyes, I know that it still lives at the borderline of uh, depths where some light is still found, so around a thousand meters. But everything past a thousand meters below tends to have tiny eyes like moles. And even and those are just like remnants. They don't even work anymore. So they're just like uh, non-functional eyes. So that is a great question. And I always use eyes when I look at and I try to identify fish to get an idea where they're living in the deep sea. And then why don't they get crushed? My answer to that mainly is they probably don't have any air inside them. So air is what gets compressed and smushed. And so if they, they probably don't have any air inside them, they probably also have different types of bones. They have maybe softer bones or, um, and maybe a lot of like gel gelatinous material that gets affected less by the, the weight of, pre of the pressure that the ocean imposes at that depth. Well, so those adaptations are super cool. A lot of kids know the blobfish, which has become very famous. The blobfish does not look like the blobfish when it's deep sea. It looks like a fish. And then you bring it up and then because it's sort of, its body yeah. is designed to push back against that much pressure, when you bring it up and there's less pressure, it sort of collapses and it becomes a weird looking thing. Um, but that's a really, really cool question. We've got this twice today already, which is super neat. Um, I'm going to take one more question from Ms. Brown. They do have a mic now, which is great. And I will note for our class, if you want to find out more about Tuwame's amazing work, she's on Twitter at Bug Tuwame. She highlighted that at the end. And Darwin Foundation, if you want to see more about the amazing work that her and her team do, there's so much to discover there about their work in the Galapagos. Uh, and it's a really special opportunity to learn. But Ms. Brown, Miami, come on back in to wrap us up with one final question. Hey, guys. Oh, there's the button. There we go. Hey. Hi. 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 Let's say that you want to become a marine biologist. What would be the first step that you should take in terms of qualifications in that field? Uh, great question. Uh, I wish I had taken more science topics. Uh, I didn't. Um, I didn't do that many, but I think taking biology really helps. Chemistry, math always helps. Uh, but um, if you're not into the maths, which I wasn't, don't let that put you off at all. Uh, but yeah, any any bio, any biology is good. But honestly, I think uh, if you want to become a marine biologist, it's a it's a competitive field. There, you just it's you have to be passionate about it. So I would say, go out and snorkel and 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 go into the sea as much as you can. Go swim, get a mask, and even if you think there's not a lot a lot in your beach, maybe you think, oh, there's 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 no sea mount here, there's no coral reef. That's not true. Go and just like observe in the sediment. There's there's life everywhere in the ocean. You just have to sometimes stay still and just stare and you'll see things start moving. And don't be freaked out about them. They're not trying <laughs> to kill you. <laughs> I used to get freaked out. I used to see something move and just dash. Um, and I think it's it's really important to build that relationship with the ocean. Such a nice message. It's something that we hear from a lot of our marine biologists. Just get out there and talk to people. I, again, marine biologists don't bite. People that are involved in the ocean are really keen to share their passion and enthusiasm. If you reach out, you're likely to hear back some great stuff. <coughs> Those people that you ever had on this broadcast started by finding a mentor or someone at the university that invited them onto a ship, a dive, what have you. That can go a really long way to fostering a really exciting career. So. Oh, man, this has been so much fun. Thank you so yes. much for your enthusiasm and knowledge. And I really hope our classes take the chance to check out more of everything you do. Um, I'm off to our Queen of Mantis program in a minute. But before I do what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. Miss Joseph's class, Trinidad, so nice to have you for taking on Miss Brown. Miss Dylan's class, thank you for having a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.